perfect. Turn this on. Okay, there we go. I have really, really, really enjoyed this weekend. Um, I told them on the, the boat that if you would have told me that I was going to be teaching the Gospel of Luke on a boat in Nebraska, I would have thought someone was praying a joke on me or something. Um, but it has been such a fun weekend for me, and I, I seriously am so thankful to have been able to be here. Um, I will go anywhere and teach the Bible to anybody who asks it, because it's my favorite thing to do. So thank you for letting me uh, do that with you this weekend. One of the things we've been doing um, is we've been looking at the Gospel of Luke, and we've had five lessons together now, so this is the fifth. And we've been looking at the unique stories that if we didn't have the Gospel of Luke, we wouldn't know about. And so we spent some time uh, in our first session looking at Luke 1 and 2, this incredible song by Mary and another song by Zechariah. We spent some time looking at Jesus teaching in a Nazareth synagogue. We looked at, don't you love the parable of the Good Samaritan? Don't you love that one? Don't you love the parable of the prodigal son? We wouldn't have those were it not for the Gospel of Luke. And this morning we looked at another favorite story, uh, Jesus and Zacchaeus. Another favorite story, uh, the wee little man, right? We wouldn't know any of these stories were it not for the Gospel of Luke. And so I thought it'd be fitting. We started in our very first session Friday night looking at Luke 1. And right now we're in our last time together. And we're going to look at the story at the very end in Luke 24. It's a story of Jesus with two men on a road, on a road to Emmaus. And were it not for the Gospel of Luke, we wouldn't know about this encounter of Jesus with these individuals. But before we look at the story, let me share with you. I don't know that my clicker is connecting here, Spencer. Um, let's see here. There we go. Um, there we go. It's working now. In 2014, so I'm taking this picture. In 2014, um, we, we had been married four years, and we decided we're about to start having kids, or at least trying to have kids, and let's take one last hoorah before we get chained down here with kids for a while. And we were, I was a minister at a church in Memphis, Tennessee, and we loved our church so much, and we had some best friends at that church, Todd and Peggy. They're a little bit older than us, but we were best friends, and we said, let's do something crazy and go to Europe for two weeks. Let's go see some things we've never seen before. And so we planned this trip for a year. This trip was planned to go to London, spend some time in London, to go to Paris, and then to spend a whole week in Italy doing Rome and a bunch of other things. This was kind of our big hoorah before we try to have kids and re recognize we're probably tied here for a long time. So... For a year, we planned for this thing. We were so excited about it. We would have dinner at each other's houses and just say, what do you want to see? And I mean, I am also a very type A personality. So Robin will tell you, before we left, I had a binder and I had us planned what we were going to do every day. And we had all the information we needed to know about all those things. And that's me when I go on vacation. I want to see everything that I possibly can. And so we're ready to go on this trip. And when all of these meetings were happening... Uh, when we got there, Todd Strickland said, I'm, he's not like me. He is not a type A. He said, I'm along for the ride. I'll just go wherever y'all want to go, and I'm just kind of here. He said, there's only one thing I want to see. I want to see Normandy Beach. We're going to be in Paris. I want to go up. He, he loves World War II history. Of course, Normandy Beach, there's so much history there. He said, I just feel like we'll be so close when we're in France. We've just... I may never be back on this part of the world again. I've got to go see Normandy Beach. So, okay, we'll do that, Todd. Let's do that. Well, if you've never been, it's actually not easy to get from Paris to Normandy Beach. Uh, it's actually hard to get there. And so we had to do all this research. And you have to, from Paris, you have to take a train. And so here we are on our train. And you have to actually get off that train and then take another train. And then when you get off that train, you have to take a bus. And Normandy's not like some huge town. It, it kind of shocked me. I thought it'd be a huge tourist, you know, visit. It's hard to get there. And of course, I don't speak French. So it, it was a, an arduous journey to get up to Normandy. So we... 
We do it though. We get up one morning, we get on the train, we go, we take the other train, we get the bus, we find it in Normandy, we found a couple people that spoke English that could point us where we needed to walk to, and we finally made it to the Normandy Museum where you take the tours of the beaches. So we go inside the museum, we go up to the counter, we say, we would like to sign up for a tour. And they said, apparently you don't know how this works. Our tours are booked out weeks in advance and you have to sign up for a tour weeks in advance. We're fully booked, you can't go. So we have done all this stuff. We have gone through these extraordinary lengths. We've been excited about this for a year and here we are and we can't see it. So we looked around the museum, we got back on the bus, we went back to the train, we took the other train to the other train, went back to Paris, and we were so disappointed. It was Todd, that was the one thing, the one thing on the whole trip he wanted to see. We felt so terrible for him. That is not even close, I think, to the disappointment that we encounter in this story. In this story, we meet two people that are absolutely crushed. What I think is the best way to approach this is for us to read this text in one reading, and then we'll go back and kind of look at some things and see some lessons in this text. But would you turn to Luke 24, and I'm going to start reading in verse 13, and this is where we're going to camp out today. Let me say a little context of where we are. Jesus has been crucified. He's been put in the tomb. This is the first day of the week. So this is Sunday. And at the beginning of Luke 24, the women have gone to the tomb and they have seen that the tomb is empty and they don't know what to make of that. Their first inclination was not to think resurrection. They don't know what to make of this. So an angel has to appear to say Jesus is risen. The the women run back to the eleven and they tell them, An angel told us, we we went to the tomb, it's empty. An angel told us Jesus is risen. And in verse 11, the the 11 apostles, look, say it says, they did not believe what the women were telling them because it seemed like a foolish idle tale. No one thought Jesus was risen from the dead. That was not what their first inclination was. So then we pick up here in verse 12. Apparently, here are two people who have heard the report of these women. Now that same day, two of them, who is them? Those who had heard the report of the women. So they're disciples of Jesus. They've been following with Jesus. They were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles away from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still with their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened over the weekend? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was going to be the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen visions of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into His glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, He explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning Himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going to go a little bit further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he immediately disappeared from their sight. They ask each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? 
They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them assembled together and said, It is true! The Lord has risen and He's appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when He broke the bread. What an interesting story, right? What an interesting story. In this story, Jesus appears to two people on the road to Emmaus. Now, those that were with us this weekend, you are not going to be shocked that after we have a story of women who encounter the risen Jesus, what do we have to have? Right. And we know at least the name of one of them, Cleopas. And it is possible that this is two men, but it could be possible that this is actually a male-female pairing, and this is Cleopas and his wife. The second person's just not named. And possibly part of the author's strategy in doing that is that maybe we're to see ourselves in this unnamed disciple. We're supposed to be on this road and encounter Jesus, that we're supposed to see ourselves in this story. As they're going along the village to Emmaus, it's about seven miles from Jerusalem. You can imagine that even if they're walking briskly, this is going to take at least two hours, probably. If they're walking in a more discouraged gait, it might take even longer than that, right? We don't exactly know where Emmaus is, but this is a seven-mile journey of disappointment. They are utterly discouraged and disappointed. And as they're walking along, Jesus comes up with them. And the irony is they're talking about Jesus to Jesus. They don't recognize who He is. They're so downcast. They are so discouraged. And so Jesus comes up and asks, what's, what are you discouraged about? And He said, are you the only one who doesn't know what's happened? And what is amazing is what they know. Did you listen to what they know? They know everything. They were there. They said Jesus was a prophet, powerful in work and deed before God. He was crucified. He was buried. And we even heard that some women went to the tomb this morning and it was empty. And we even heard that an angel told them that Jesus was... They have actually heard that the resurrection happened. Do do you hear me? And yet they are still discouraged. Isn't that an odd thing, right? I mean, we think if you hear resurrection, you ought to be happy. They're still discouraged. I think part of it is, I think part of the reason they're discouraged is their phrase that they say, we had hoped He would be the one to redeem Israel. Even if He had been raised, even if that were true, in their minds, He had not redeemed Israel in the way they were hoping that was going to happen. Does that make sense? I think one of the things that's interesting to do in in not just Luke 24, but the rest of the Gospels is this, as we're heading to Easter ourselves, is to think about the reactions that we see to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And here's what I tell students. If you were going to be inventing these stories, this is an odd story to invent because... They include these reactions like the immediate response of people like these two individuals is that they were disappointed. (laughs) You read verse 11. The women come and say, we've just heard from the angel that he's risen from the dead. And what do the the 11 apostles react? What do they say? We don't believe this. You're just telling us foolishness. That's an odd story. That's an odd detail to add in here if you're trying to invent a story to get people to believe in the resurrection, right? I think these seem more appropriately like eyewitness details of how it really was when somebody comes and tells you something as crazy as Jesus was risen from the dead. The the Gospels don't seem to be... um, making this up. They, they don't seem to be inventing stories. And by the way, and, and I make sure to tell my students, this is not me saying this. This is ancient world 2,000 years ago. But guess who you would not feature as your primary witnesses to this event if you're trying to invent a credible account? Women. You see that in verse 11. That's why these male apostles, their first reaction is to say, this is foolishness. 
But by the way, I think Luke includes this, loves this story, because as we've seen over and over and over and over and over and over again, I think the reason that women are the primary witnesses, the first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus, is the great reversal. Jesus turns the world upside down. And in a world where it would be expected that the Son of God would come primarily for and to men, who are the first witnesses? Who are the first people that get to say out of their mouths that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead? Who is it? It's women. You talk about a religion that lifts up and exalts women. It's Christianity. And it was known that way for centuries and centuries and centuries. It's fascinating to think about this. Why does Luke include this story? First takeaway, I think, is this. Sometimes the journey of life is filled with disappointment and it's hard to see Jesus. Sometimes life doesn't go the way that we want it to. And even if you're a person in this room right now who knows that Jesus died and was raised from the dead, it doesn't mean we'll never experience disappointment in life. It doesn't mean that we'll never experience sadness and grief and disappointment. Sometimes this is just the nature of the journey. It stinks. Have you been there? These two are. And I think the reason one of them is nameless is because we're supposed to see ourselves on this same journey. Sometimes it just stinks. And it's hard to see Jesus in the daily walk of life. But Jesus responds to them. And He says, there's a little rebuke in here. They know all the right details. It's funny because He calls them slow of heart. But I actually think there's some irony in here because they know all the right details. They're just too quick. You know, they hear about all these things and already on the same day, they've not even stayed in Jerusalem to process what's happened. They're already marching home. Knee-jerk reaction. We do that sometimes when we're frustrated, right? Or in grief. We, we react knee-jerk. And so what Jesus says, ironically, he calls them slow of heart, but I think what he's actually critiquing them for is you need to slow down and actually think about what you just said. You just said that Jesus is risen from the dead and you're somehow disappointed about that. You need to actually slow down and think about what has just said because did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into His glory? And remember, it's a seven-mile journey, so a minimum of two hours, right, uh, on this walk. And so beginning with Moses and the prophets in the Old Testament, He began to explain with them what was in all the Scriptures concerning Himself. Don't you wish you could have been on that road? Right? This is one of those times where I'm like, one verse, come on, tell us a little bit more. I want to hear what Jesus said here. If you were on the boat this weekend, and even if you weren't, you cannot get Jesus unless you get the Old Testament. You cannot get Jesus unless you get the Scriptures. Here is that in our faces. Jesus is explaining the significance of Himself from Moses and all the prophets, from all of the Scriptures. As they approach the village, I think this is kind of funny. As they approach the village, I think this, I don't know, I think there's some irony in this. There's, there's supposed to be a little bit of comedy in this story. You can imagine, um, we've already seen some of the comedy. Jesus walks up and they don't recognize him and he's like, what are you guys talking about? You know? And they're like, you haven't heard about Jesus? And he just stands there and lets them tell him everything about himself. He doesn't interrupt them. What things? What are you talking about? You know, there's some comedy. There's some irony here. And so here we get to another piece of comedy. He's been traveling with them, and it's time to kind of turn on the road, but Jesus just kind of like, mm, what, what are you going to do? What, what are you going to do? He acts like he's keep, keeping walking, and they say, come to our house. This is hospitality. Come to our house. Come stay at our house. And so even though they're kind of slow to believe, they're hearing Him, and they do one thing right in this story. They invite Jesus to come and stay with them. They invite Jesus to come and spend some time with them. So He goes in to stay with them. This is my advice to anybody in here that's on this road that is living that disappointment, that finds it hard to actually see Jesus. 
This story reminds us that Jesus is present with us even when we can't see it. He's there even though they don't know it. He's there even though they feel discouraged and disappointed. Even when we can't see Jesus, this story reminds us He's there. And the best thing that they could ever do, even though they're disappointed, is invite Him to come spend some time with them. For people in pain, it's hard. You may not want to. You may not feel like it. When life's not going your way, one of the best things that you can do, even if it doesn't make sense in the moment, is trust that Jesus is there and invite Him to come and be in that with you. When He's at the table with them, He took bread and He broke it and He began to give it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized Him. So what is the moment that their eyes are opened and they recognize Him? It's while they are eating. Breaking bread. Something powerful happens when we break bread. Something important happens at a meal. So they ask each other, man, when we were on that road, were not our hearts burning within us when He was opening the Scripture to us? I think one of the things that this story is trying to prepare the disciples for and for us for is... In a real way, Jesus is not with us. In a, in a real way, His body is not with us in a physical sense that we can touch. But what this chapter is making the point is that Jesus is absolutely with us. And one of the ways that Jesus is with us is our hearts burn when we open the Scriptures together. Something happens when you go on a boat and you sit around a table and you read the Bible together. Something powerful happens. Jesus is with us. Our hearts are burning because Jesus is with us. And although I can't touch Him physically, He is there. Didn't the Messiah have to suffer these things? And so beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained what they said, what Scripture said concerning himself. This weekend I used this illustration. I love the Avenger movies. Um, I only got into them because my son got into them. He's eight now, and so I guess a couple of years ago he was younger, and he liked Spider-Man and all those things. So I got into it, and I got way in more into it than I ever expected to, and I actually cried at the movie Endgame. I couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe I was that into it. But what those movies did, those Avenger movies did, is they tied together all 26 of the movies that came before them. I don't know how people have the brains to think that far ahead. I don't know how they have the skill to be able to take all these different plot lines and connect them together in these movies. That's exactly what Luke and Jesus right here are doing. Is They're saying all of the plot lines of all of these prophets and scriptures and law, all of it points to Jesus. And I don't think what Jesus is doing here, in fact, Luke says he's not just doing this, he's not reading a couple of verses here that he's picked out. He says, beginning with Moses, he goes through all of Moses and the prophets. It's the whole thing. The whole story is summed up in Jesus. We've been seeing this all through the Gospel of Luke. Jesus gets up and opens the scroll of Isaiah in Luke chapter 4. And after he reads Isaiah 61, he rolls it back up. He sits down and he says, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is talking about me. He's doing that again here in Luke 24. The whole thing, the whole thing is talking about Him. Then when He was at the table, He took bread, He gave thanks, He broke it, and He gave it to them. And it says they actually first recognized Jesus at the breaking of the bread. Did you notice that? Let me ask you guys this, those of you who are familiar with this text. When it says that he was with them at the table, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to them. Does that sound like anything else you've ever heard before? What does that sound like? The Last Supper. It's the exact same phrase. Two chapters before. That thing we just did right here. 
exact same Greek phrase, not a word different. And actually, it occurs earlier in the gospel. In Luke 9, when Jesus is feeding the 5,000, he takes the five loaves and the two fish. He took it, he gave thanks, he broke it, and then he gave it to them. It seems like the Lord's Supper itself is an extension of what happens in that miracle. And then the meal that he has with these two are, is an extension of the Lord's Supper. Has Jesus ate a lot in the Gospel of Luke? Where do we most come to see who Jesus is and recognize Him? At the table. The most important thing that we will do today, we just did a moment ago. Because it is at the table that we truly recognize who Jesus is. Sometimes life is filled with disappointment. The best thing that we can do sometimes is just trust that Jesus is with us even if we can't see it and invite Him in to be with us. And here is, if we'll invite Him in, here's how He will make Himself known to us. Here's how He makes Himself known to this church. Even though He's not physically here where we can touch Him, here's how He makes Himself known to you. Here's how He is here with you. One way is through the reading and studying of Scripture together. That's why what we did this weekend together, every time we met together, I didn't just talk the whole time. We actually broke up into groups and read Scripture together. And there's a reason for that. When we read Scripture together, Jesus is there with us in, the, in our midst and our hearts burn within us. There is something powerful that happens when people read Scripture together. Now, I'm not knocking daily Bible reading by yourself, but Scripture says there's something hap that happens when we do this together. There's something formative. Jesus is in our midst when we do that. But there's another time that Jesus is particularly present with us. It's in the Lord's Supper, and the extension of the Lord's Supper is when we break bread together at our tables. Think about what this is. This is the body and blood of Christ. And I actually think, so it's interesting we're taking the blood of Christ, I think our, sometimes our view of the Lord's Supper is a little anemic. And by that I mean whenever we take this, so we just use this language of just remember. You just need to sit here and remember. But when Jesus takes this bread, He said, This is my body. What's the purpose of that? When you take this, I am with you. My body and my blood is with you. I am amongst you. I am in the midst of you. And the reason we get together on the first day of the week and do this, and we don't do it as opposed on Friday on the day He's hanging on the cross, is we do it on the day He was risen from the dead so that when we get together and we do this around the table, we're reminded that Jesus isn't still on the cross or in the tomb. He's alive and He's with us. Jesus makes Himself known to us when we read Scripture together. When we take the Lord's Supper together and when we have hospitality with one another, this is how we come to recognize Jesus Christ. And immediately, Jesus disappears from their sight. And many commentators have read, this is unusual. Why does He disappear so quickly? That's kind of cruel, actually. The moment that they recognize Him, poof, He's gone. Do you notice that? Kind of cruel, actually. You know, peekaboo, gone, right? They haven't known who He is, and all of a sudden their eyes are open, and then He's gone. Why? I think the point of this is, He leaves right here because when their eyes are open, this is what they see, and this is what every disciple ought to see. Even though Jesus isn't there with them physically, He's now disappeared from them. Even though He's not there physically, He is now within them. And for us, even though He's not here physically, He is within us. We have just partaken of His body and blood together. He is within us. He is amongst us. And when we read Scripture, He is amongst us. He is alive. And as we read Scripture, we're reminded that He's alive. As we take this meal, we're reminded that He is alive. And we do this together. And just like those guys, our hearts, we have holy heartburn. Because He is here with us. This is a little picture my wife's 
snap this weekend. As we gather together around tables to study scripture and to eat meals together, he is with us. That's what this story reminds us of. And so immediately, what do they do? I love this. They got up and they went to tell somebody. If your heart is on fire because you come to see that Jesus is with you, it ought to make you get up and go. Thought there'd be an amen there. Y'all are not an amen in church? Okay, all right. (laughs) If you realize that Jesus is alive and your heart's on fire for Him because you've been eating together and because you've been communing with Him through the Lord's Supper and because our hearts are on fire as we walk away from Scripture, we ought to get up and go tell somebody about it. Thank you. And now they're seven miles away. They're in Emmaus. They're seven miles away and they get up and they have to rush back to Jerusalem and say, He really is risen. I hope that's what this Easter season does for you, is that it sets your heart on fire and that as a church, as the Nebraska City Church, as you sit around tables together and read Scripture, as you eat together, I love that today just happened to be potluck. It's almost like that was planned. I love that we get to do this. And as we do this, as we laugh, as we eat together, as we think about all the times that Jesus ate together, it ought to lead us then to have holy heartburn so that as we leave this building, we got to get up and go and tell somebody. That's what happens in Luke 24. I want to end with this, um, just before we have our invitation. The reason Jesus eats so much in the gospel, I don't think, is because he had an eating problem or something like that. The reason Jesus eats so much is because in the Old Testament, what it says is, on that day when the Lord's Messiah comes, and the end comes, the thing you ought to look for, like Isaiah 25, 6, is a feast. You ought to look for a table. And you ought to look to sit around that table with the Messiah. And what we do when we sit around this table together, what we're actually going to go do when we have this potluck together, as we sit around that table together, and we're sitting with the saints, and we're laughing, and we're reflecting on Jesus, and we're worshiping, and we're praying, as we're sitting around that table, it ought to give us that holy heartburn for the day that we get to do that at the table of the Messiah forever and evermore. Amen? That ought to be an amen. Okay, thank you. It's an anticipation of eating at the banquet with the Messiah. That's why there's so much food in Luke. It's not food for food's sake. It's getting us excited when we're at the table for the day that we will be at the table with the Lord forever. And if you want a seat at that table, it is as easy as repenting of your sins and coming to Jesus and giving your life to the King that God has appointed to be the Messiah and King of the world. And if you want to talk to the shepherds here, or you want to give your life over to that King and be at that banquet, we would love to see you do that. If you would like to be baptized into the name of Jesus the King, Jesus the Christ, we would love to see that happen today. We're going to sing an invitation song and stand, and you're welcome to come while we stand, while we sing.